I would like to acknowledge um, co-workers on this, particularly Irene Fortune, who I think is on the line, and also from the States, uh, Anne Scarborough Bull and Milton Love. And Milton must have one of the best uh, email addresses, love at Santa Barbara. But uh, they were instrumental in, in putting some of this work together. And it was independent work, but was um, financially supported by International Oil and Gas and Oil and Gas UK, who are very interested in how decommissioning works, but also in terms of what kind of habitats form around man-made structures in the marine environment. So the impetus for this, for me, was understanding the ecology and science of man-made structures. So I'll start there. And the first thing to say is that we've been putting stuff into water for many, many years. And it's interesting that the kind of legislation we develop around man-made materials that end up in, in marine and aquatic systems is very different. So for instance, the legislative framework for dealing with wrecks, such as the Costa Concordia on the bottom left there, uh, oil rigs, bridges, and debris are very different. But we deliberately put things into the, to the water for economic um, and social reasons, and they are, are spread around our coasts. Of course, as soon as you put anything into water, you begin to develop an ecosystem. And that starts early, within almost minutes of material entering water, it can develop an organic film on the surface that becomes colonized by bacteria and viruses. And then that succession begins to develop into much more substantial three-dimensional ecosystems. And the biomass of these systems is sufficient that uh, in the early days of putting, uh, thinking about decommissioning, the, the biomass that was attached to rigs that had to be removed from the water was something that had to be added into calculations because they can make a significant difference to the weight that has to be removed from the system. But they're interesting ecosystems in their own regard. In terms of, you know, how much material we put into the water. If you look at a map of, of wrecks, for example, then you'll see that there is a wide distribution of, of wrecks around the planet. In terms of fixed platforms, um, and I'm told I should really refer to, to fixed platforms rather than oil rigs and to get the terminology correct. So in terms of fixed platforms, there are about 6,000 worldwide. They, they obviously have a wide geographical range they have a wide contextual range in terms of water depth and the substratum that they're on. But one of the arguments that's always quite often made about their impact on the environment is that they have a relatively small spatial footprint. But that's also mitigated by the fact that that footprint may be quite different from the surrounding habitat. And so that may be a hard substratum where there was normally soft substratum. So that introduces heterogeneity to the system. There are also all of the infrastructure that uh, accompanies the actual platforms themselves, such as pipelines, bundles, and that all changes the nature of the sea and interacts with the ecology of the system. In terms of forecasts for decommissioning, it, it's obviously been uh, increasing rapidly. And so we're probably looking at decommissioning of about 2,000 of the 6,000 platforms in the next 20 years. But that doesn't mean that more won't be commissioned, as, as Hannah pointed out, and that more platforms will be put in place depending on the circumstances, global oil prices, and of course, how we view the ecology of uh, petroleum, petroleum exploration. But it seems likely that, that um, initiatives will still be going on. It seems hard to say that society will suddenly stop using petroleum products, and that seems very unlikely in, um, in the current circumstances. So in the North Sea context, which is what I'm mainly going to be talking about today, we can see there's a, a widespread of, of uh, platforms in the North Sea and the infrastructure that supports them. And as I've said, they provide heterogeneity to sometimes um, quite 
homogenous systems. And they interfere with other activities such as um, transport, navigation, fisheries. So there are many aspects to be taken into account when judging the ecology of these systems. And while, you know, we're beginning to see better planning for the end of life of, of structures, there are still about um, 1,350 offshore installations within what we re recognise as the OSPA maritime area, um, which are maturing and will need to be dealt with in some way or another. So how are we dealing with them? Well, that varies depending on where you are in the world, but we are under the regulation of the OSPAR Convention, which is the Convention for the Protection of the Marine Environment of the Northeast Atlantic. The OSPAR Commission decided in decision 98-3 that uh, offshore structures should be recycled and disposed of on land as the preferred option. And when they say preferred, they mean preferred. There are few derogations, depending on specific circumstances of structure, that might allow them to be left in place. But really, the message is, if you can take them out, you should take them out. That's going to cost. Um, that I've seen wildly different estimates of the, the amount of money, but we are talking billions of pounds. And probably a 50% of that total cost will come to the taxpayer. I've seen estimates of that costing every child in Britain £3,000 in coming years. Um, I think those, those costs are quite fluid and again it depends a little bit on the state of the economy and the industry and how the technology for decommissioning advances, which it is quite rapidly. So we've got a lot of work to do in terms of decommissioning. And where did this OSPAR decision come from? Well, there's a little bit of, of history and, and politics, I guess. Many of you will be familiar with the term, the name Brent Spar. And the, the Brent Spar was a, an oil storage um, and loading buoy uh, operated by Shell. And in about 1995, it came to the end of its useful life. And actually, Shell did quite a good job in looking at the options for decommissioning of this quite large structure. And they looked at a number of different possibilities. Um, they came to the conclusion that removing the, the buoy, towing it out to the deep Atlantic and um, providing some means of uh, sinking it there would be the, the best option in terms of reduce uh, the minimum environmental impact and uh, the best way of, of dealing with this. This led to uh, an outcry, particularly spearheaded by Greenpeace. And the basis of that was to do with the way that we handle the marine environment, that it shouldn't be used as a dumping ground, and that uh, the uh, structure itself contained, contained quite a lot of contamination. And this was a bone of contention um, at the time. In the end, um, in a sense, Greenpeace got its way because uh, Shell changed its mind and the Brent Spar was towed to Norway, where it was kept for a while and then eventually used in uh, development in Norway, harbour development in Norway. So you, in a sense, that was a, what you might think of as, as a good outcome. What wasn't good really was the way that um, uh, the, the public reacted in some ways to this, in that Shell bore the brunt of um, severe uh, criticism and even to the extent of arson attacks in, in particularly in Germany. So the, this caused really quite a, a problem both for, for Shell and, and really for society in thinking about how we make decisions. And it was shown late, laterally that Greenpeace had actually slightly misrepresented the facts in terms of the amount of contamination that was on the Brent Spar and was far less than they had claimed and so this is a, a, a sort of suggestion of the first sort of false news that was coming out. Um, we're getting more used to that term now. Anyway, Brent Spar went on land and was repurposed, or at least some elements of it were repurposed. However, the, the political pressure had been mounting during this period, and so 11 states um, called for a moratorium on, on sea disposal. 
and in 1998 OSPAR announced an agreement on how um, oil facilities should be treated and that that was onshore disposal into the future. So that was um, a response to a particular set of circumstances which is interesting. It was backed to a, a certain extent by um, environmental impact assessments that were carried out but the result of those assessments was overtaken um, by politics. So this is the question, if we are dealing with an increasing number of um, or, um, structures that have to be decommissioned, what do we do with them? And is this the best option um, in terms of total removal and returning the area to its uh, previous state? So. In terms of the North Sea context, we have about good biodiversity, 230 species of fish. Um, some estimates put us at 10 million seabirds, comprising about 85 species. We have charismatic species as well, I'm glad to say. Uh, minke whale, dolphin, porpoise. And many of the species that do occur in this list of biodiversity are threatened and, and listed in some way including things like uh, the basking shark, black-legged legged kittiwake, and of course our, our charismatic coral, the cold water coral, coral uh, Lophelia pertusa, which is now Desmophyllum uh, pertusa, just to allow some confusion in the ranks, but it's been renamed recently according to Worms, the, the biological database. So we have a, a system that has biodiversity that is worthy of protection, and therefore, how should we deal with that? Interestingly, the OSPAR Commission says it focuses on protection and conservation of biodiversity and ecosystem functioning in marine systems. And it says that it will be done through the development and implementation of appropriate measures, particularly targeting coastal and marine biodiversity. So uh, we're on the same side. OSPAR is looking to improve ecosystem function and biodiversity. And I think most of us would agree with that. In terms of how we assess and, and look at um, the science behind this, then this is just a, a diagram of a fairly typical North Sea food web. I've included a, a structure in here because I'm going to make some comparisons to a rig system. And this is the Bass Rock, which as you may know, is one of the largest gannet colonies in the world and more or less on a, our doorstep, at least from where I am in Crail in Fife, I can almost see it out the window, but not quite. So this is the, the kind of interactions you would expect. If you replace the um, bass rock with, with an oil rig, you have some similarities in the sense that you have a structure that spans the depth from the, the bed of the ocean to the surface and beyond the surface. So you have the same intertidal region, you have hard substrata, which can support various types of organisms following that succession I mentioned earlier. In addition though, you have some other things you have to consider, such as the operational procedures, the commissioning procedures where drilling is taking place and drill cutting piles are being formed as indicated here. There is pollution and that varies at different phases between the commissioning, between the operation, and would also do so during decommissioning, depending on how that decommissioning was carried out. There are some areas that uh, are more different. For instance, I mentioned that the Bass Rock was a, a massive gannet colony. That's not what you will get with oil rigs. They are used by birds to a certain extent, but to a much lesser extent. So that's a part that is not similar between the systems. And you might also mention scale. Um, certainly the Bass Rock is a much larger system, but then we've got to think of how many platforms we have around in the North Sea and what they might or might not be providing. So we can begin to, to think about these things in a, a kind of comparative way and look at the science behind it um, without getting involved in the politics initially. Although it's interesting to note that uh, the, the politics does come in uh, when you, you start thinking about science because um, this is uh, an environmental impact assessment for the Ninian North platform. And uh, during the survey of the, the platform, it was found that uh, Lophelia pertusa, which is uh, uh, at-risk species, um, worthy of protection, was colonizing the platform. 
And the statement in the environmental impact assessment makes that clear that Lophelia covered five to, in some places, 100% of the surface area. But because of the Ospar Convention and the, the Habitats Directive, it's clear that this cannot be counted as an ecological value of any sort. Because growth that occurs on a, a structure, a man-made structure, uh, cannot and uh, need not be considered under the Habitats Directive. So you can discount it as being part of the environmental impact assessment. That's interesting. Um, it's also interesting, I spoke to a, a colleague at JNCC who, who were talking about this and they said that if Lophelia had grown off the bottom of the legs of the platform onto a substratum underneath, then it would be counted. But if it was only on the legs of the structure, then it wouldn't be, even though you might argue that it was only by having those legs that that extension might have taken place. But the situation is that anything that grows on a man-made artificial substratum is not considered as ecology. So looking at what does use the, the, the platforms, um, I mentioned the birds, there's, there's limited research and information a bit um, on how birds use platforms and it's to do generally with either resting phases while they're migrating or being attracted to, to light and flares and, and that's especially in poor weather. And so the, there's a sort of possibility it's helpful in some cases and damaging in others. But um, as I said, more work needs to be done on that. In terms of the underwater biodiversity, I've mentioned the succession through the biofilms and many of the species that come to use the platforms and they range up to the, the sort of more charismatic sea mammals and sea turtles and we'll return to that a bit later. The ecology is obviously based on a hard substratum developing a three-dimensional structure and of course once you have a three-dimensional structure it begins to impact on the other organisms, pelagic and demersal fish etc that can use these structures as feeding grounds and nursery grounds. It isn't particularly easy to study though and there is information out there and again it varies regionally, probably more information from California, some from the North Sea, less from um, Malaysia. So we know that fish become associated in some way with platforms and that that has the geographical context and also the um, context of the depth of the platform and uh, what organisms are beginning to use it. There's also some information on some sea mammals that are associated or seem to be associated with man-made structures, particularly pipelines. And there's a little bit of evidence that there is some interaction between uh, sea mammals and um, the, the structures in the marine environment. But again, um, more work is needed and, and some of it is being conducted in cooperation with um, some oil authorities, including uh, programs like the Insight program, which is I'll, I'll come on to a little bit later. But one of the things that becomes clear when you look into this is that there are huge gaps in knowledge about how we understand the interaction between these man-made structures, how they change with time, and how um, they develop this ecology and how valuable that might or might not be. One of the interesting uh, debates that emerged was this attraction versus production debate. It was true that higher fish biomass was found around man-made structures, but whether that was really in terms of production or whether these were just acting as sites of aggregation for species, so that you would find more species there, but that uh, they weren't really benefiting in terms of biomass. There's been more work done on that and now it seems that there is a genuine production element to man-made structures, particularly in places like California where more work has been done. Um, and so the figures range, but there does seem to be um, a contribution, whether or not that contribution is, is very significant in all circumstances is certainly open to question some studies finding only maybe four or five percent increase, whereas um, other studies put that figure much higher. So one of the things I just wanted to mention about this kind of work is that it is difficult to do and that 
how we organize this work is could be beneficially uh, done through cooperation with some of the, the oil and gas authorities and the responsible partners for running the rigs. And uh, so I was just giving a, a, a note to this, which is the Insight program, which is entering its second phase. Insight was a, a program conceived in 2020 to bring together um, the academics that can study these things with the, the companies that need these answers. And as, a, as an independent initiative, to help provide science in support of these questions. And so it's good to see that kind of initiative happening. And one of the studies they conducted was to do with uh, connectivity between the different structures in the, the North Sea. And that programme has just started to publish um, some of its results. And that's a, an interesting feature that in fact, using these rigs as stepping stones may promote the, the spread of biodiversity and the maintenance of biodiversity. And there may be connections between those sites and also marine protected areas, given that the rest of the area may be exploited in different ways and also hard substratum may be lacking for some of these um, types of community. So we have to make decisions about these systems and that can be difficult. And we have to look at habitat assessment and we have to look at the data we have and also the gaps in knowledge. So we're interested in the, the productivity of the systems, how we judge that productivity with, with metrics, the dynamics of the system, the local dynamics and the more widespread dynamics with fish coming in to feed from systems perhaps, the ecosystem services they provide and then this last one I just mentioned which is connectivity. And certainly it seems that biological productivity can be high in man-made structures and that when comparing um, man-made structures with natural structures there are sometimes quite evident increases in biodiversity and productivity and again this is context dependent and depending on where you are in your oceans but certainly there are areas where these man-made structures seem to provide a boost to at least local ecosystem services. So we've got to make decisions on, on the, this you know, change in ecology, is this worthwhile or is the risk of leaving structures in place too great? So what we'd like to do is, is adopt a holistic approach and not do it just on single metrics, but to go through multiple criteria. And this is called multiple criteria decision analysis or MCDA for short. Taking into account the activities of decommissioning and the, the possibility, different possibilities for that. Now, if you do look at this uh, diagram, you'll see that in the North Sea, we're really up at this end of the diagram and there's less chance of looking at alternative uses, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't consider what those possibilities would be. So with a, a, an MCDA, you look at the health and safety, technical feasibility, economic value, the environmental context and the societal consideration of it. So it's not going to be a necessarily easy process and depending on the context there may be a variety of subgroups of, of interest. For instance, nowadays we would also be interested in perhaps the, the CO2 emissions of those different activities versus in, in different strategies. Um, also, how you do the decommissioning and what is the impact of, over that? So are you using cutting explosives, etc., and how you mitigate any uh, chance of uh, damaging the marine system? So this is um, expanding quite rapidly, and there are a number of different approaches to it, uh, often driven by different authorities and jurisdictions. And some of them include the sort of more qualitative analysis, um, the expert opinion, as well as things that can be well measured, such as, well, hopefully well measured, such as the economics, um, the CO2. But we do still lack quite a lot of ecological data. And often these are subject to a potential error, which is, is known as the baseline error, which I'll just come to. But I also want to say here that the, the industry is looking at this and beginning to think about how to share data. And data is a, a thorny issue in terms of making it as available as possible. 
but also as appropriate as possible because just collecting data unless it's collected in a certain way with certain standards uh, may not be enough. It's got to reach standards that allow scientific evaluation and use. And that's a, an ongoing and has been an ongoing uh, conversation for years. But programs such as Insight are helping to develop that and developing platforms such as the Insight Interactive platform, which will help uh, data become available to the scientific community. So returning to this um, uh, baseline error, it, it's really a question of what do you judge something against? We can have this sort of simplistic approach. We're looking at a functional baseline. We have a condition and we have an action, which might be decommissioning. And then we look to see how that action uh, influences the environment. And what we would like to see is an improvement in environmental functionality and perhaps biodiversity or at least no harm to the environment. And, and what we don't want to see is a, is a decline in function and, and biodiversity. And then what point along these lines do you pick as metrics of success or failure? And what baseline is this that we're comparing against? Is this a legitimate baseline? And this is a really good question for the North Sea because one of the things that uh, platforms do is I guess there's an interaction between the platforms and the fishery. And once you remove the platforms, you can potentially re-establish fisheries. You may not be able to, depending on the structures that are left in the, the seabed, that has to be made safe before fisheries and trawling can continue. But is that the best baseline then? Or are we thinking about other baselines of where we want the sea as a marine protected area you should use as a baseline? Or is that unfair to expect that of the the decommissioning process. So it's a, a philosophical as well as scientific question. What I would say pro probably is that a sensible thing is, is not to get too tied up in metrics, but to think of trajectories of improvement in that the actions that we take should at least be targeted at improving the functionality of the system. And that that should be done in a, in a multi-criteria way, looking at uh, more than uh, a single metric, but as many metrics as possible. And eventually there will have to be a, a sort of political decision, which is taken at the level of the, the legislative authority, which may be OSPA or somewhere else. One of the things I didn't mention about that is timeline. You know, how, how long do we expect these trajectories to um, be effective by. I mean, this is just a, a paper on uh, dredge um, activity, and you know, after dredging had stopped for aggregate extraction, it can take seven years, even after low intensity dredging, for the system to return to some metric of normal based on um, environmental um, proxies such as production. And in high intensities, maybe even a decade isn't enough. These recoveries can be quite slow. And therefore, we should be thinking and planning that this may take time. And there's an interesting quote here that if we're in the North Sea at the moment, we don't see how it was in the past. And therefore, what's our ambition for the future? Is it enough to rely on that past information? So decommissioning in some parts of the world has more options to consider than in the North Sea. And where you do have those options, then you can think about what you do with those platform structures. Do you remove them or could you tow them, cut them and tow them to some place where they could provide benefit? Um, you could topple in place where that would be safe at that particular site. And in some cases, there's a partial removal option where the, the top is taken down to allow navigation, but the rest is retained. And there is data on what happens in some of these cases, and uh, uh, this is um, from the United States, showing that where you have partial removal, you can preserve a lot of the, the standing stock or the biomass of, of fish around those uh, structures. And uh, this may be a special case in the sense that these are uh, uh, reef type fish. And so they were benefiting from this habitat as if it was a reef and then allowing that structure to stay in place helps maintain that. If you remove it completely, then you lose all of that population 
and that heterogeneity in that particular system. But it's not all uh, roses in the sense of you, know, you, you think of leaving structures in place might be beneficial. There are threats and, and, and risks in that. One of them I've mentioned is how you handle leaving the, the structures in, in a suitable um, legacy, not to be troll, not to damage fisheries, etc., and to be safe for navigation. If you do leave them in place, then they're providing potentially connectivity, which we mentioned as a, a possibly a, a good thing, but there are aspects to that. If you get invasive species, then suddenly that connectivity doesn't look so good anymore. And you get this kind of space invaders effect where you may end up with um, uh, problems in terms of uh, biodiversity that you weren't looking for. And then there are the inherent risks with uh, the oil and gas industry and you know, what is the, the, the chance of risk and who is the liability for what is left behind, whether it's partially removed or, or fully removed. And um, this is probably a bad example because this isn't after decommissioning, but this is the Deepwater Horizon. And uh, we know that accidents can occur. And although in, in general, the, the record is quite good, um, we have to maintain standards to ensure that into the future. So the OSPAR convention doesn't allow us some the, the flexibility that uh, is allowed in some parts of the world. And it's a question is, you know, as to what the science is in order to support thinking around the decommissioning process. So I'm just going to ask a, a quick poll here. It's the first time I've tried this, so I, I don't know how it will work. But basically, OSPAR 983 uh, prohibits the dumping of offshore structures. Um, given that we are lacking some data and given that in certain contexts you can argue that the biodiversity and functionality of these artificial reef systems is enhancing local conditions, um, do you think that OSPAR decision 98.3 should be reviewed? And OSPAR is generally reviewed, decisions are generally reviewed every five years or so. Okay. so it, Okay. Sorry, David, uh, just to let you know, uh, so the poll's been launched. You should all have a little notification of that question. Do you think the OSPAR decision 98 slash 3 should be reviewed? There are three options. Uh, please, I think you can only choose one. Please choose one. Uh, yes, no, and not sure. Uh, I can see that many of you are already voting, uh, 64 out of 92. Oh, they're coming in right now. I hate to break the news, David. Uh, you can't vote. I've not allowed panellists to vote, so... <laughs> We'll have to hide that. Um, okay, just wait for a few more people to vote. We've got less than 10 people to vote. There may be some that are struggling with the technology like I would be. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> are you able to see the, um, the poll itself, Dave? Does it come up on your screen at all? I've got the poll, but you won't let me vote. And yeah, oh. yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay, so. 85 out of 91 people have voted out of our attendees. Um, if you've got the option to, please select your option, your answer now. And I'm just going to end it now. Um, so the result of that was 81% of uh, those who voted said yes. So that was 69 of our attendees. Um, and 7 said no and 11% said not sure. Okay, thank you. That's, that's very interesting. Um, okay, so just to finish off. Um, so the, the, this um, work was supported by some of the international oil and, and gas producers and also um, Oil and Gas UK. So it would be interesting to think why we're interested in these ecosystems and why they might be interested as well. The sort of cynical view is that um, perhaps leaving things in place is cheaper than taking them out. Um, that might be true, but there is still science behind this and the science should be understood. And I'm not in favor of, of following a blanket rule in either way, in the sense that these structures may be beneficial in some contexts and certainly they are in some parts of the world. The North Sea might be different. 
after consideration of the, the potential benefits, it might be that the obstruction to fisheries is too great. And of course, fishers have to be involved in that um, discussion. But there may be regions where that connectivity, the linkages with MPAs, is useful and beneficial to maintaining biodiversity across the, the North Sea. So it's a, a, it's a proper debate and, and this should be influenced strongly by the science. And so programs like Insight, etc., I, I think are to be applauded in helping to produce that science and the second phase of Insight is, is just being launched. But I also applaud, you know, people wanting to find out to make the correct decisions. And uh, I would support that into the future. And I'll end there with uh, the presentation just to once again thank my colleagues at uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, and Irene, who put together a lot of the, the data for this. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Okay, great. Thank you for that, David. Um, I think we can all agree that making data accessible through the Insight program will, will, will be well received. Um, I can see that we've already had uh, five questions submitted through the Q&A box. If anyone who's um, still in this session wants to ask a question, you can use either the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, you can type it in there, or you could even raise your hand um, and I can unmute you. So that's what I'm going to do first. Uh, with, there's one person who's got their hand raised. So I'm just going to allow them to talk. Um, I believe, I apologise for my, if I pronounce this wrong. Oh, no, their hand's gone. Okay, no worries. We'll go straight to the questions that are typed in. So the first question was, is there an open access database gathering the geolocation and structural information of the 6,000 oil rigs at sea? Where are the rigs to be decomm decommissioned located? Um, interesting question. I, I don't have that data, but I suspect each of the companies will have data on that and there may be some uh, people on the, the call who could answer that better. Um, obviously, it's when these rigs are coming to the end of their lives. So the areas where the first exploration uh, took place is, is probably um, ripe for the end of life and decommissioning of some of these structures. So I can try and investigate that and um, ask some of the oil industry how good a database they have of this, but certainly we have numbers and uh, I, I do have a map in my office which shows some locations, but I'm not in my office at the moment, so I can't point the, the screen around, but we can try and follow that up for you. In terms of, uh, Hannah, I can just read these myself rather than you reading them to me and then uh, sure, I, was just, uh, I wasn't sure if most people, if some people didn't know where the Q&A box was and just thought it would be a good feature just to say them out loud. <laughs> um, for Simona, again, I'm yeah. happy to be able to answer more positively on this one, that um, there are actually programs um, being conducted on connectivity using things like molecular markers for species that are found on rigs. And so they're being investigated through um, simulation and modeling of currents and of larval flow and that's been backed up by analysis of the, the genetics and one example I know of is the blue mussel. Um, Simone has been very active so there are <laughs> international standards for oceanographic data processing um, which, are the, which are the new data and the new data standardization needed? Good question. Um, I guess whichever group you ask, they'll come up with slightly different standards. But it seems that, you know, things like British standards and um, you have organisations like uh, DNVGL, which are sort of um, produce standards for operations. And I, I think uh, what we need is a kind of standards for operations in terms of collecting environmental data. Uh, the next one is... Beth, um, Beth Scott, sorry, I'll say the full name. Um, as we move to a world where we are moving towards engineering and using the oceans uh, as we have done to terrestrial habitats, yet with the difference that the, we, the public, own most of what is in our local seas by the seabed, what should be the route to allowing people a say in how and what and where uh, we allow to occur in our seas? I think that's a, a great question. And it's one we've, we've been 
uh, working with more in the coastal region, but the, the same applies to offshore. And it's sort of the difference between a, a landscape and a seascape. That the, the seascape is less obvious to people. So when you talk about activity in the sea, it hasn't really been until the, the you have something cataclysmic happening like, like uh, Deep Sea Horizon or where the public gets a, a particular flavor of something like the plastics uh, issue. So it's a question really of, of ocean education and to bring people along and to make sure that science is part of the decision making, but that society is also part of that decision making. And I think that's an area of um, rapidly advancing um, research. And uh, I think Beth has a, a finger in that um, anyway. Uh, just to say, uh, David Wolf has his hand raised, so I'm just going to allow him to talk. So we might get someone calling in. Okay, uh, David. Hello, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes, very well. Go ahead. Okay, that's great. Um, well, thanks very much, David. That was really interesting. Um, I did write this out, but I thought a bit of personal contact might be good. Um, my, my interest in you know, clearly there is a, an objective methods multi-criteria analysis to do this um, but my fear is it gets ceases to be objective because people have come in from very different directions of different scientific opinions um, have different priorities so I guess the broad question it is you know who decides what gets included as the criteria in a multi critical criteria analysis and, and who decides how they're rated because um, it seems to be that's where it gets very political and you could come to almost any conclusion you like according to what you weight. I, I totally agree with that and it, it is one of the, the difficulties of keeping things in-house and so the regulators have um, a strong role here I think to help um, make sure that that process does not become too biased in, in one particular way and another because I'm sure members of industry would say that it could happen the other way around too, that um, things become too weighted towards particular in, environmental bandwagons. Um, so it, it is a really difficult thing, but it really has to be the, the regulator that I think takes a role in making sure that those procedures are acceptable. And I mean, that's what environmental impact assessment is about. It, it's supposed to be to allow the regulator to make assessment of what can go forward and what can't. And so it seems quite reasonable if, if multiple criteria assessment is, is used, that the, the sort of balance and how that assessment is also controlled in some way um, going to be difficult to do, I understand. Okay, thank you, David. Great. Okay, uh, going back to those that have been typed in, our next question was from Magnus Johnson, um, which says, the footprint of the oil industry is pretty minimal compared to the renewables industry. Are there any lessons in particular to learn from oil to renewable energy? Absolutely, and I think the, I think it's, um, start with the end in mind. I think one of the, the so that's a, a, a Covey statement, if anybody knows Covey, but the, one of the big problems with the decommissioning process is that it wasn't designed into a lot of infrastructure that was put out, or at least it wasn't thought about in ways of thinking about a circular economy, reuse, repurposing, um, and how that could be done with the greatest efficiency. So what I would hope is that the, the renewable industry, particularly offshore renewables, are thinking that way. Um, and certainly with some of the, the, the materials that are going out, there may be easier ways to, to handle them, things like floating platforms. But we still have the problem of the materials that are being used, and a lot of the materials that are being used are not recyclable as far as I know. So yes, I think there are lessons to be learned in a, a, I think that cooperation between the industries does occur um, and that, uh, you know, translating that knowledge from decommissioning would be highly useful. 
Um, the next question comes from your colleague, David. Uh, are there any projects to support science from masts, uh, mattress reuse? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, uh, it's a straight answer to that. The, the, sorry, uh, to put this in context, concrete, concrete mattresses are, are used in the offshore industry for a number of purposes. Um, in terms of their reuse, then there was a thought that they could provide a substratum for artificial reef development or perhaps coastal protection. Um, the problem is they're defined as waste and that that brings with it some requirements to test for the presence of materials etc on them. But there are projects um, potentially investigating and I think SAMS has been running one of these. Um, the, the ecology and the potential um, I guess the potential impact of those mattresses if they were used in different locations to where they had been placed. Okay, okay. next one's from, I'll just do it, Hannah, yeah, say, go for it. from uh, Carol Barbone. Um, oh, she's asking what the composition of the audience, so I can't answer that. Yeah, uh, um, I'm not too sure at the moment. All I have is everyone's names and the voting was anonymous. Um, so, uh, can't really answer that just now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, hopefully we can kind of break it down, uh, hopefully uh, with uh, some shape or form with the information that was uh, provided when folk registered for this uh, talk. I, I would guess that there are, I know there are a few industry people online because I circulated mm -hmm. the, the um, invitation, um, but I don't know what the actual breakdown is. If I had a list of participants, I could probably give you a rough guess, but I think it's probably going to be 10 to 15 percent industry and largely academic. But that, that's mm -hmm. my guess. Uh, information on, sorry, the next one's anonymous, but it's to do with the use of uh, platforms by seabirds. Um, yes, uh, offshore structures are used by birds and I, I know that, for instance, there are, I think it's uh, Guillemot's um, uh, now nesting on offshore structures at, at Sulem Vo, which is more to do with the piers than the offshore platforms. I think there's less on the offshore platforms and there's less information, um, but it would be fantastic to gather more information about the seabird use. I know that there is some concern for not so much the, the static platforms, but things like in, in the squid fishery where vessels use a great deal of light at night um, and how that can be uh, moderated using different wavelengths of light or using shading to prevent uh, problems with uh, either attracting birds off their migration routes or giving them a, a, a false um, target. Um, so it's a good question, but I, I haven't done, there. I don't think there's a huge amount of information out there on it. This is from Jack. Uh, how do you view the development of marine renewable energy? I think I've sort of answered that in the sense that marine renewables are, from a carbon point of view, to be greatly supported. Um, however, there are issues with the emplacement in marine systems, about whether they're tidal systems taking energy out of the system, and that might have to be assessed. Uh, the talk last week in this talk actually was you, if you want to look at that one, because that was mentioning tidal turbines and we got into a discussion about some of the environmental consequences of that. I think the, the real answer to that is that a holistic view and sort of multi-criteria analysis should be taken into account in all of these things and that we're getting more sophisticated in understanding the interaction between structures and the environment, but there are still gaps in knowledge. And so I think that marine renewable energy is to be promoted but the environmental side must be treated with with respect. Uh, the next one is from Richard Herton, he's a, a representative of industry, in fact uh, got a name check because of his work on the Insight project. He asked, uh, this is the the question equivalent of a googly for anyone who plays cricket. He says, can you say something about the application of the precautionary principle and how it's applied both within and outside OSPA? The interesting thing is the precautionary principle could be applied from both ways. I mean, these structures are there. So is the biggest precaution or 
what is the biggest risk, removing them or leaving them in place? You, you could apply the precaution principles acting in both ways. So that's quite um, an interesting question. And I think it comes back to your, your viewpoint on whether or not it's at all possible that these are habitats that can be beneficial. At the moment, we can't even make that, that judgment. So um, I think being able to make that judgment is valuable. I'm getting slightly hoarse, actually. Um, this is from uh, Leanne Henry. Anyone interested in knowing which structures have decommissioning and plans in place? Thank you, Leanne. Can access these drafts here. That's fantastic. That's uh, Leanne providing the information for uh, Simona, I think it was uh, mm -hmm. at the start. So thank you, uh, Leanne. Uh, Matthew Gray. Do you think this discussion should encapsulate offshore wind farms? Yes. Um, yeah, definitely. And I, I think I've sort of emphasized that in previous answers. So it's a direct question. Hi, David. What's your opinion of OSPAR 983 and if the decision is still fit for purpose? Um, I think when I, I started thinking about this and, you know, quite a few years ago now, I, I thought that taking materials out of the marine environment was a good thing and that, um, you know, we shouldn't be using the sea as a dumping ground. And I, I still feel that. However, if, if you look at the sort of functional ecology of the system, then there are times when, or, or areas where you can argue that the, the functional ecology of the sort of regional area is improved by these structures. And I think that part of what sways me in that is that the North Sea is not an unimpacted habitat. It's already been fished for hundreds of years and is not a natural system. So suggesting that the kind of judgment we should make should be against the backdrop of the North Sea is the problem of the false baseline. And so sometimes I think that, you know, enhancing heterogeneity and functionality in a system um, can be supported, but I think it should be on a case-by-case -case basis. And then that would mean that OSPAR 98.3 should be reconsidered. Uh, so Irene Fortune is uh, pointing out that Edmodnet has data on oil and gas platforms in the North Sea and the Mediterranean as well. So uh, we'll maybe be able to ask Hannah to include that somehow in the, the uh, stuff that goes on the web. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <clears throat> right. Here's another um, interesting question. So the OSPAR 2020 to 2030 thematic strategy is being developed. And this refers to the European idea of maintaining good environmental status as part of the European uh, Marine Framework Directive. So what properties and baseline values uh, are or should be used to measure the status? Well, Good environmental status already has 11 indicators and that includes biodiversity and it includes some target species. So you might say that those are already um, there. However, I suspect that the European Commission will also be reviewing uh, the indicators of good environmental status and that, again, there is flexibility in that system. Um, and I think that it's right that these features are continually reviewed. And the question of what is good environmental status for one particular um, set of, of circumstances might not be the same as another. And I think that's exactly what the problem with OSPAR is. It, it, it's put in a, a blanket control, but that developing into the thematic strategy for the future, they should talk with the European Commission and, and look at how good environmental status is developing and what the best indicators might be under those sets of circumstances. So I can't say, or say now these properties and these baseline values are what should be measured, but I would also like to see the idea of trajectories of change included in there. The, the, a simple metric isn't often what you need, it's that you, you are driving the system or helping the system recover in the right direction rather than saying there's a particular figure that you need to meet. <laughs>
Uh, okay, this is uh, Erica Knott. What similarities do you see between oil and gas platform decommissioning and re uh, renewables? I think that's a, a question that's come up before. And it said that um, we should be thinking to the future. And in terms of uh, Marine Scotland, I think that's what they're trying to do. Sorry, the rest of the question said, what did you think of the recent Marine Scotland decommissioning draft uh, guidelines? Um, I think that's what they're trying to do is to, to start with the end in mind. Um, so that this is better planned than the initiation of the, the sort of offshore oil industry. And I, I guess we've learned a lot since those days, so that uh, planning is improving. Okay. Tom Baxter. Hi, Tom. Uh, do you think that funding for ecosystem understanding is hindered by what's the point as OSPAR mandates removal? However, as legislation has allowed for repurposing for marine ecosystem um, advantages, much more effort would be directed at gaining evidence. Interesting question. Um, I, I think there, that how I've heard it phrased in the commercial sector is that industry wants to know what it has to do. And so for some industries to say, right, you have to remove it, it is good because it's easy. It says, right, this is what we have to do. Let's get on with it. So the actual question of um, deciding on whether a habitat is, is uh, functioning well or whether the removal is damaging is, is immaterial. It allows a sequence of events. And I can understand that, but I don't like it because I think that you know we should be able to discuss the science behind removal, when it's a good thing, when it might be not such a good thing. Um, and so I think you're probably right that if that mandate was removed, there would be much more impetus for research. But part of that from the commercial side would be economic as well as to the cost benefit analysis of, of different procedures, depending on how the, um, regulators were applying the, the standards. This is Anna Adeo. Would leaving parts of the platforms at sea imply regular monitoring of its marine diversity and also the state of the structure itself, possible degradation? And would these costs be even higher in the long term than the short term removal of the structure? Yeah, good question. Um, I'd actually like to see monitoring what for whatever happens because what one of the gaps in our knowledge is exactly we don't have a lot of data sets following a sort of multi criteria analysis after decommissioning so that would be would be very useful so yes I think longer term monitoring should be part of our ambition in terms of costs um, cost of removal can be quite high um, they're usually higher than expected um, and then there's a question of liability. And I think it's liability that is one of the, the sticking points. You know, who takes over the liability after a certain period of time or is it in perpetuity, et cetera. So that's quite scary for leaving structures in place if something could go wrong and who might be blamed for it. So I think, again, there's a, a governmental responsibility there um, to help um, with that, as uh, has been done in the States. So. Yes, and I, I think that was, um, sorry, the question's gone, so I can't go back to it. Um, but yes, I think the continual monitoring is, is an important feature that would very much help plug some of the gaps and help make decisions into the future. Uh, anonymous attendee, is there much industry lobbying for OSPAR 983 to be changed? Um, as I've said, I think that, you know, for the oil industry, clarity is probably more important in, in some ways. Um, and how might non-industry science-based marine conservations have an influence? Um, well, that's by things like ICES and, you know, talking to people who are involved in the process and, and helping for some non-industry science-based marine organisations, they can provide information. Um, and the more information we have, then the better the decisions that could be made if, if we're open to discussing 
uh, other alternatives to just complete removal. I think, Hannah, I'm reaching the end of my ability to speak. <laughs> yeah, no worries, we have gone slightly over time. Um, there are a few questions left, so um, I'm not sure how best uh, you want to go about answering those, Dave. We Maybe could. Um, I can't tell. Is it just? Uh, is it just two? There are seven questions left. Uh, we could uh, record uh, your answers to the remaining questions later, and then add that onto the uploaded YouTube video. Okay, let's do that. I'm sure everyone wants okay. to go and get coffee. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so just to reiterate, uh, this whole session was recorded online and David and I will go through the remaining questions and we'll add that on to the end of this webinar. So if you did submit a question and haven't heard your answer, uh, it will be up on YouTube very shortly as well. Uh, we do have a series of other talks coming up, so uh, please check out the registration link you used to join this uh, session to find out who we have coming up. Um, Thank you, David, for your time. That was a really great talk and a lot of questions were answered. So that was really good. <laughs> and I have to say congratulations. You had the biggest turnout of attendees for all our, since our mass webinar series kicked off. <laughs> well, I think that's out of three. So I, I, I won't start <laughs> celebrating yet. But, um, thank you, everyone, for your attention. And if you do have questions, then my email is on, on the screen at the moment. I'm very happy to, to talk to anyone if they have an interest. Okay. Great, thank you very much, David. <laughs> um, so, yeah, when you're ready, please run through the remaining questions that were submitted in the um, live webinar session yesterday, please. Okay, thank you. I'm going to continue with the questions we received. And the next one is uh, anonymous, and it says and asks, has there been much work done on the social acceptability of decommissioning or what public concerns and perceptions are? I think the answer to that is it's very limited. Um, there's certainly the public become involved very strongly when something goes wrong. But in terms of how the public view the seascape, um, how we interact with that, and what happens in terms of oil uh, platforms, I think there is very little of the sort of socio economic side that has been strongly pursued. So I think a, a lot more should be done on that. The next question is from Gillian McKinnon and uh, she asks if I can comment on the level and types of contamination that could be re-released from the seabed by disturbing the structures. Is the level of contamination known? I, I think the level of contamination is quite well known and actually the way that um, the seabed has been managed has changed with time. In the past the drilling fluids and muds were much more contaminated than they are now because of a change in practice and the drilling fluids are much less um, harmful to the environment. The drill piles are therefore less contaminated, although there is some, still some contamination there. In most cases, the idea of disturbing the drill cuttings piles is, um, has been considered and generally avoided that the contamination that does exist within the bed is probably best left there and that um, any mechanism of trying to withdraw that contaminated sediment or, or deliberately spreading it is um, probably not sensible. So there is quite a lot of information on the nature and types of contamination that have been collected by the companies themselves and that's required by the regulator. Um, and that generally, if possible, the, the drill cuttings piles are, are left undisturbed. Uh, there's another anonymous one. This is a, a long question and it outlines the fact that uh, there are OSPAR guidelines on artificial reefs and these are were first published in 1999. Um, we know that the OSPAR convention excludes the, the dumping uh, of material on seabeds and, and that includes the leaving of it. But it is suggested that if the, the placement of um, structure is for a purpose other than that for which it was uh, designed, um, it can be left there if it's in accordance with the relevant provisions of the convention. I think this is very rarely followed in the sense that there are so many um, hoops to jump through in order to try and 
consider something that has been put into the seabed for a commercial purpose without foresight of, of how it might end up as a, as a marine structure makes this very, very difficult. Um, the question then goes on to ask is, is the issue here would be the separation between a structure being designed for another purpose and the structure being solely designed uh, to act as an artificial reef. And I, I think that's correct. There aren't many um, actual structures that are designed to create artificial reefs per se. Um, there was some research carried out at, at SAMS uh, looking at creation of artificial reef structures and that, that's ongoing research or has been in place for quite a long time. The sort of idea of creating artificial reefs is, is more commonly followed in other parts of the world than in UK waters. Um, the next question is from Simona uh, and she asks uh, would it be worth reconstructing the historical state of the ecosystem and by that I think she's talking about the historical state of the North Sea. Yes and, and people have tried to do that um, but again that's a very difficult baseline if we're talking about the false baseline issue then it's a very difficult thing to establish because of the length of time that the, the North Sea has been impacted. But we can look at things like um, uh, marine protected areas and we can look at things like um, areas where uh, activity has been minimal to begin to think about what that environment would look like. But I think I come back to the idea of trajectories of change and that we're looking for improvement in systems rather than having some idealized version which may in, in essence be wrong anyway, because times have changed and conditions have changed. So shooting for something that was a, a historic ideal may not be sensible either. Uh, and the final question, which uh, comes from Simona again, and I think she gets the prize for asking the most number of questions. Um, and her final question is, shall we encourage the conversion of rigs into different facilities e.g. luxury hotels, fisheries facilities, or rigs to, rigs to reefs. I think that really comes down to economics. I mean, we're talking about rigs that are, you know, miles offshore in extremely difficult circumstances, you know, open ocean conditions. Um, I don't think luxury hotels are really going to be profitable there. Uh, there's been a number of suggestions of how to repurpose rigs like that, and include, including aquaculture facilities. And again, none of these have really taken off because the economics just don't add up. Um, I think the, the rig to reefs is a much more uh, tractable possibility. But as I said, you know, we don't have the ability to, to move these structures and to have them used as artificial reefs under very easily under the reg, um, legislative framework that we currently have. Okay, okay, that's the end of the questions. Thank you. Great, thank you. Do you have any summarising points that you would like to say? The, the, the final thing I'd say is that this has attracted quite a lot of interest and mm -hmm. I think one of the things we might be able to do is develop this conversation further using um, representatives across the board because we don't know exactly how many people from industry joined this discussion and certainly the regulator should be involved as well. So the next um, phase of this might be to try and have a, a sort of panel discussion with regulators, industry and academia discussing these issues and I've had a few people suggesting that that might be a good thing. Um, and that might be done independently of this uh, seminar programme or it might be a, a later part of it. Uh, but we'll discuss that with some of the people that have suggested it and see if we can do something along those lines. But uh, thank you for everybody. And as I said, um, any errors in this I take responsibility for. Thank you. <laughs> Great. It's good to hear that there's been some already positive feedback from your talk. That was a really great talk from Professor David Patterson from the University of St Andrews and who is also our Executive Director of the Masts. If you enjoyed this talk, you'll be pleased to know that we have plenty of other talks coming up in the next few weeks as we all work from home. Um, if you're interested in any of the talks, please use the same registration link that you've um, used before to attend this event. And there should be on your screen um, 
the list of our upcoming webinars. If you would like to present, please let us know. Um, we have plenty of slots in June and July available, even though they're not listed here at the moment. Um, we want anyone who's an early career researcher, a PhD student, um, anyone involved in policy, charity, conservation, you name it. If you're involved in marine science and would like to give a presentation, we will give you the platform to do so. So please drop us an email as shown on the left hand side of the screen and we look forward to hearing from you.